Good evening and welcome to the 5.30 service. It's always a joy to meet together. It's always a joy to worship our God together. The psalmist understood this when he called on the people of God to shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. It was through the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross at Gethsemane that means we can enter these gates with thanksgiving. For out of his care and love, he redeems us, leads us, and keeps us. So let's enter the courts of heaven with praise as we sing of the one who holds us with his powerful hand. Our Lord is our strong deliverer and we have much to give thanks for, much to say sorry for as well. When we remember what our Saviour has done, it is hardly surprising that we feel our guilt and shame over our own sin as we come into his presence. So let us together bring our confession. Join me as we say these words together. Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour. In what we have thought, in what we have said and done through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. Hear then this great assurance that the Father of all mercies has cleansed us from our sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Our sins are washed clean. It's why we enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise. Let's sing of that mercy he shows us that is far more than we ever deserve.
great the chasm. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name.
I'm Sue Stamper Iverson, part of the church family here. Please join me as we bring our requests to our mighty Heavenly Father now. I'll end each short prayer with the words, Lord, in your mercy. Wherever you are, please respond with hear our prayer. Let's pray. Mighty God and Father, we lift to you this world you created with all its beauty and diversity and possibility. With so much of it scarred and fearful, broken and divided, we long for the day when you will return and fully restore. For this present time, we ask for your powerful intervention in the pandemic. Give wisdom to those who lead this country and the countries praying with us this evening as to how to proceed justly and effectively. Bring unity so that we may work together in our communities, our countries, our world, to tackle this disease. We cry to you particularly for those places where war and famine already threaten to overwhelm. In Yemen, in Syria. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate Father, we give you thanks for all our mission partners and today ask that you would protect and grant good health to our mission partners who've recently returned to the Middle East. We pray for wisdom in the decisions that need to be made within their organisation, both locally and internationally, as they seek to translate and share your word. And we ask for your provision as they seek to support children with special needs. Please give them discernment in knowing how best to encourage and serve local seekers and believers in these challenging days of turmoil and anxiety. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Merciful Father, we pray for the persecuted church around the world and today particularly ask that you would give comfort and courage to followers of your son Jesus in Mauritania, where it's illegal to convert from Islam to Christianity and where converting is seen as a betrayal of tribe and family. Please encourage and sustain Christians who find it almost impossible to meet together to worship and the many who need to keep their faith secret as they risk being ostracised from their communities or even face violence. In the wake of severe drought, COVID-19 and a poor economy, we pray too for your mercy on the people of Mauritania and for your provision for the poor and vulnerable. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we pray for this All Souls Church family. As we listen to your word this evening and as we feed on it day by day, may we know you better and show you better to the world around us. Show us how to live for you in this time and how to be a welcoming and loving family. And we ask that you will have your hand on us as we wait for the person you have chosen to serve here as our new rector over these next years. Keep us faithful to you and guide every aspect of this appointment so that it may please and honour you and bring glory to your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, gracious Father, we pray for ourselves as individuals. As we understand more deeply what our forgiveness cost, may our lives reflect that understanding. Help us to root out in our hearts the sin that binds us, the lack of forgiveness that enslaves us, the lack of thanks and trust that denies us peace. For those for whom the road is tough, grant us strength to get up and go on. And grant that we who follow you, even though we have no strength of our own, may be channels of your comfort and lights in the darkness through your strength and power. And we pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom 
the power, the power and, and the, the glory are yours, now and, and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks so much for tuning in today. It's that time of year when many new people join the church here at All Souls. It may be that you've taken up a new job in London, started at university, or simply looking for a new spiritual home. As a church, we're always keen to welcome newcomers. Of course, how we can do that all looks a bit different at the moment. But if you are based in London or plan to be based here in the near future, and if you are interested in making All Souls your church home and want to be part of life here, we really want to get in touch with you and welcome you into our church family. Can I encourage you to visit allsouls.org forward slash hello. The link is in the description below. And while we still have restrictions on meeting together, we believe the best place to start is in a small group. And on that link, you can find details of how to do that and be put in touch with the right people to help you. And even if you have been attending All Souls for a while and have decided you want to join a small group for the first time, do also visit allsouls.org forward slash hello. Now we are so grateful that with the help of modern technology that we've been able to come together each week to worship like this. Yet I think we would all agree that we miss meeting together in person. It's why, while we are committed to our online services for the foreseeable future, we have also been working hard towards opening the church on Sunday to worship on site. We have met at 11.30 these last two months, and I am delighted to let you know that as of next Sunday, Sunday the 20th of September, we will be starting the 5.30 service here in church, subject, of course, to any new government restrictions. And we'll be in touch this week with more information if you'd like to join us next Sunday. So many things have been delayed by the lockdown, and one important issue is the need to update the electoral roll. As an evangelical Anglican church contending for the truth, the more people who sign up to the electoral roll strengthens our voice. So if you are part of our church family, please do make it a priority. You can sign up by following the link on the screen below. The Lord has been so kind to us as a church through these past months, and in large part, this is down to the generous financial support of you as our church family. Thank you. And as we remember each week, all things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. It really has been a huge blessing to begin to start using All Souls again for worship and prayer. You see, a building like this makes so much possible. So let's hear from Louise and Paul about what we need to do to help maintain this platform for the gospel and help us live out our vision to be all for Jesus. For the last six months or so, all many of us have seen from All Souls have been from this perspective. But beyond the camera, there's a whole building. Since July, we've begun to welcome people back into All Souls for a prayer during the week and for a single Sunday service. It hasn't been quite the same, of course, with social distancing, face masks, and not being able to sing, but it has been good to be back in the building and gathering to worship together. But not being able to meet for so long and then beginning to return has made us even more aware of how thankful we are for the strategic location and the striking building we have. For now, enough to allow social distancing, and for the future, enough to gather in much larger numbers again. Starting to reopen the building also reminds us of the work required to keep it running and fit for purpose. All Souls is nearly 200 years old. We will celebrate the building's birthday in 2024, and as many of you will be aware, the building needs some pretty urgent work to keep it watertight, ready to welcome worshippers, inquirers and visitors, and for the next 200 years. Last year, we launched a significant project to raise funds for these much needed repairs. The roof over the main part of the church is deteriorating and there's already some water coming in. Our storage for water is also long overdue a replacement um, and the front steps require a lot of restoration work. In short, we have to undertake repairs to the outside of the building and the roof space fairly urgently. Thanks to the generosity of the church family, including significant contributions from the church leadership, the fundraising project we launched last year has already passed the half million pound mark. But we still have some way to go. We need something like 1.2 million in total to undertake the work and to raise that money over the next 18 months. Our hope 
is that we'll be able to start working in early 2022 and have everything completed in good time for the church's 200th birthday. As Paul says, many people have already been extremely generous. If you'd like to help us keep All Souls as a gospel platform, there are details of how to give on our website. Some people are choosing to set up a standing order for a specific period. 18 months would take us to the envisaged start of the work. It's a tough, tough time for many financially, and we're acutely aware of that. Whether or not you feel able to support the project financially, please pray with us that it will be possible to fully reopen the church soon, that we will be able to complete this building project, and that All Souls will have its doors wide open to welcome future generations to encounter Jesus and worship with us here. Thanks, Louise and Paul. We conclude this evening our series, When God Asks the Questions. So pick up your Bibles as Caroline and Steve come to read for us. Hi everybody, we are Caroline and Steve. This evening's reading is from Mark, chapter 15, verses 33 to 39. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Good evening. If you've got a Bible there, please do keep it open at Mark chapter 15. About 13 years ago, while I was at Bible college, I spent a year in the chaplaincy of an asylum removal center. It was a place where failed asylum seekers were held before being deported, and it was full of sad stories. But I remember one afternoon in particular when a man from the Congo approached me and put a crumpled piece of paper in my hand. It was a fax from the government's home office informing him that his final appeal to remain in Britain had failed. At the end of the week, he would be deported. And his eyes filled with tears as he told me that his whole family back in the Congo had been murdered. And if he were sent back, he too would be killed. Where can we go when we are utterly alone? Is there anyone who understands what it is to be forsaken? I don't know what happened to my Congolese friends, but we prayed and read Psalm 22 in the few minutes we had together. These words that Jesus quotes from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To feel alone is probably the most inhuman experience we can have because we were made in the image of a God who is a loving community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To be human is to be in relationship. And so one of the most tragic things about COVID-19 is that at the time of death, sufferers often die alone. They have the love and care of the medical teams, of course, in hospital, but isolated where they are, they're cut off from their loved ones, perhaps with just a phone held to their ear to listen to the final words of love and goodbye. For Jesus to die alone was the most inhuman experience. And yet his experience was even darker and deeper than that. He is a member of the Godhead in whose image the human race is made to be relational. And at the cross, that eternal divine fellowship of love in whose image we were made was so disrupted that for the first and only time in history, God forsakes God. Over the summer weeks, we've been following a series in our evening services, When God Asks the Questions. We began with God's question to Adam in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, where are you? 
And we end the series tonight with almost the same question. Where are you? Only this time, God isn't asking the question of man. God is asking the question of God. Where are you? Why have you forsaken me? Four features stand out in Mark's short account of Jesus' crucifixion. The darkness, the desolation, the curtain, and the confession. We're going to think about the first two for a moment or two. First, the darkness. Astronomers tell us that the sun is the brightest body in our sky. Its diameter is more than 100 times that of the Earth. Its temperature is estimated to be more than 5,500 degrees. At 93 million miles away, it's the closest star to the Earth. And yet light from the sun takes about eight minutes to reach us. And energy from the sunlight sustains virtually all life on Earth and drives our climate and our weather systems. But in Mark chapter 15, verse 33, Mark tells us that at noon, when Jesus was crucified, darkness came over the whole land for three hours. At the time of day when the sun was at its height, there was darkness. Now, this wasn't an eclipse. First, because the darkness lasted a full three hours. And second, because the Jewish Passover, when Jesus died, is always celebrated when there's a full moon. No, something much more significant is happening, and Mark wants us to know it. The separation of light and darkness was the first and most fundamental part of day one of creation. The sun was created to point to Jesus, the true light of the world. And now as Jesus, the source and light of all creation, is extinguished on the cross, darkness overwhelms light. You see, darkness in the Bible is a sign of God's curse. We might think of the three days of darkness that fell on the Egyptians in the judgment plague of Exodus 10. Or Jesus' warning of the judgment for those who reject him, that they will be cast out into darkness. The prophet Amos prophesied that on the day of the Lord, when God would judge the sins of his people, the sun would go down at noon, the earth would be darkened in broad daylight, and it would be a time of grief and mourning as for an only son. That's Amos chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. Darkness is a sign of judgment. But as we look at the cross, we have to ask the question, on whom is this judgment falling? Was God's judgment falling on the Jewish leaders who handed God's son over to the Romans? Was it falling on Pilate, the Roman governor, and his army who had crucified him? Or perhaps on the crowds who had mocked Jesus? No, the Bible tells us, for these three terrible hours of darkness, no one else is mentioned. All of creation, seen and unseen, are relegated to spectators as judgment falls on one man. To understand it more, we move from the darkness in verse 33 to the desolation in verse 34. At three in the afternoon, Mark tells us, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And surely this is the most chilling cry ever uttered. The one who had only ever known the love of the Father in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit now calls out, and the Father who was always there is nowhere to be seen. The son's cry is met with silence. Jesus' cry of desolation is so mysterious that some have tried to explain it away as if it merely expressed how Jesus felt but wasn't objectively true of what was happening. And yet even if we cannot understand it fully, we must be careful not to avoid the depth of what is going on. The Bible says there is only one thing that can separate a human being from God, and that is sin. Isaiah 59 verse 2, Behold, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. 
Jesus had no sin of his own. But at the cross, he bore on himself the sins of the world. In fact, as 2 Corinthians 5, 21 tells us, he who had no sin became sin for us. He became the very essence of what it is to reject and forsake God. And so he was rejected and forsaken by his father. On the cross, he suffered the darkness of God's judgment. This is the heart of what happened at the cross, an agony worse than the physical torment he suffered, that the one who had only ever known the love and fellowship of his father now is rejected and forsaken for our sake. To say that God must punish our sin, but Jesus steps in as a third party and bears that punishment for us is not quite right. It's helpful, of course, to have a little outline, perhaps to scribble on the back of an envelope as you share the gospel with someone. But as an account of the atonement, it's not quite enough. At the very least, it leaves us wondering about the character of a God who seems like a harsh judge, desperate to punish sin and just happy that someone pays the penalty, even if they're innocent. It overlooks the fact that the one on the cross is God the second person of the Trinity. At the cross, it's God in the person of the Son who bears the sin of the human race. And God, who on the cross intercepts his own divine judgment in our place. It's God the Son who took human nature to himself and was born into his creation as a human being for the very purpose that one day on the cross, God would intercept his own judgment. It's the deepest mystery and paradox. Because even at that moment when the Son is forsaken by the Father, the Father, Son, and Spirit are acting together. Romans 8.32 tells us that the Father gave up his Son for us. And yet in Galatians 2.20, we see that that wasn't some unwilling victim that Jesus was, we're told that the Son of God loved us and gave himself up for us. The Father gave him up and the Son gave himself up. And in Hebrews 9.14, we're told that the Son offered himself up to the Father through the Holy Spirit. In other words, at the cross, it's God who offers himself up to God. God who bears God's wrath in our place. God who makes satisfaction to God in those three hours of darkness, we are all spectators, as God does for us what we could never do for ourselves. When you and I are tempted to sin, let's think of what our forgiveness cost God. His grace to us is free, but it was not cheap. And at the cross, we see who God really is. God isn't cold and remote, simply concerned with balancing the cosmic books of justice. He takes the problem of our sin and judgment out of our hands and bears the cost himself. Whatever our experience of loneliness or isolation, we have in God one who knows. He knows what it is to be forsaken in a way that we need never know. So, the darkness and the desolation. Those are our first two features of Mark's account of the crucifixion. Let's meditate on them for a moment with our song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And then we'll look more briefly at the final two, the curtain and the confession. How great the pain of searing loss 
The 20th century poet and playwright W.H. Auden frequently wrote about religious themes. In one of his works, he imagines being in Jerusalem on the day of Jesus' crucifixion, and he wonders who in the gospel accounts he might have been had he been there. None of us, he says, would imagine ourselves as one of the disciples, cowering in despair and running away in fear. And few of us, he says, are big enough to see ourselves as Pilate, or religious enough to see ourselves as one of the teachers of the law. In my optimistic mood, he writes, I see myself as perhaps a Jew from Alexandria visiting Jerusalem, walking along, engaged in a philosophical argument. Our path, he says, takes us past the foot of Golgotha, where we see an all too familiar sight, three crosses surrounded by a jeering crowd. And frowning with distaste, I remark to my friend how disgusting it is that the Romans should execute people so inhumanely. And then, averting my eyes from the disagreeable sight, I resume our fascinating discussion. Auden captures it well. The darkness and the desolation mark the moment at the crux of history, its turning point. But it was possible even to have been there and to have missed its significance entirely. Today, perhaps more than any age for centuries, as our culture prizes itself off its own Christian foundations and tries to rebuild itself on shifting sands elsewhere, the significance of the cross is utterly lost to many. The death of Jesus is utterly irrelevant. Thousands died by crucifixion in the ancient world. And hundreds must have died in all kinds of ways on the day that Jesus died. But Mark tells us that Jesus' crucifixion, his death, was unique in its significance and universal in its relevance. We've spent some time 
already thinking about the darkness and the desolation at Jesus' death. We've seen that the darkness was an expression of God's wrath, his judgment of sin. And Jesus' cry of desolation pierces that darkness and shows us that he who had no sin became sin for us and bore God's wrath in our place. In his love, God was intercepting his own judgment and offering himself up on the cross. It is God personally, intimately taking responsibility for your sin and mine, taking it out of our hands and saving us from his judgment at the greatest cost to himself. Well, let's look now briefly at two final features of Mark's account, the temple curtain and the centurion's confession. At first glance, glance, verse 38 seems to interrupt the account of the crucifixion. Verse 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Verse 39, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. But why does Mark take us back into Jerusalem in verse 38 to an event that no one around the cross even saw that day? The answer is that better than anything else, it shows the significance of Jesus' death. The temple back in Jerusalem was the bricks and mortar successor to the tabernacle tent that the Lord gave to Moses 15 centuries earlier. And built into the design of the tabernacle and temple were lessons about God and his creation, about sin and sacrifice and atonement. You see, at the heart of the temple, were two rooms, the holy place and the most holy place. The most holy place represented heaven. In it, centuries and earlier, had been the Ark of the Covenant, a gold-covered box which represented the throne of God. And the holy place, the outer room, represented the earth. And as the tabernacle was constructed, the final thing to be put into place was a thick curtain separating the two, symbolically dividing heaven and earth, God's dwelling and ours. And woven into this curtain were the figures of cherubim, the angelic creatures set in the Garden of Eden to prevent Adam and Eve from entering paradise, guarding the way back to the tree of life. The curtain was a barrier symbolic of the barrier between heaven and earth that our sin has erected. Sin separates us from God, and if it's not dealt with, it will separate us from him forever. Well, in the Old Testament, once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest of Israel would offer sacrifices for the sins of the people and would carry the blood through the curtain into the most holy place, making atonement or at one month between God and sinful people. And now, Mark says, as Jesus offers himself as the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, God himself rips the temple curtain from top to bottom. The meaning couldn't be clearer. Through Jesus' blood, there is access into the presence of the Father, and the Father himself invites us in. Hebrews 10, 19 tells us how our sins have been forgiven and what it means. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, Jesus himself, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance. The temple curtain spells out the significance of Jesus' death. He was forsaken so that we could be welcomed in. I wonder if you've ever realized it. Jesus was forsaken by his Father so that you could be brought into his family, brought near through his blood, your sins taken out of your hands and paid for. That's the curtain. As we end, what about the confession? As Jesus cries out in desolation, most people there at the foot of the cross had no idea what was happening right in front of their eyes. Some in the crowd thought 
that Jesus was calling for Elijah. And remember the Jewish tradition that Elijah would come to the help of those who called out at the end of their lives. So one man, hoping to prolong Jesus' life and see Elijah's miracle, ran and got a sponge with wine vinegar and offered it to Jesus to drink. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. But standing near the cross was another man, a Roman centurion. And the fact that Mark records him as standing there in front of Jesus suggests that he was the one who was in charge of Jesus' crucifixion. And if so, he may well have overseen many crucifixions in Palestine, which was famous for its rebelliousness. But this death on this day was unlike any he had witnessed before, and he knew it. This centurion recognized with the eye of faith what had just happened in front of him. Until this point in the Gospel of Mark, only God the Father and the demons declare Jesus' true identity as God's Son. No human being recognizes him until this moment. Or Peter has some understanding that Jesus is the Christ in Mark 8, 29. But Mark leaves it to the centurion, the Gentile, the murderer of Christ, to make the great confession with which Mark begins his good news in the very first verse. The good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see, Mark wants us to see that to understand truly the identity of Jesus as the Son of God, we have to see him on the cross. If we don't see Jesus in his God-forsakenness, dying in our place for our sins, then the Jesus we have is not the real Jesus. You may have been a, a churchgoer all your life. Or perhaps you've just started watching church services online since coronavirus began and you're investigating the Christian faith. You can come to Christ tonight. There doesn't need to be some great crisis for it to happen. For many of us, it was just a quiet recognition of Jesus as our saviour and master and are thanking him for what he did for us. You don't have to do a course to become a Christian but we are running a new online group on the 21st of September, a week tomorrow, and we've called it Life Explored. It's a great introduction to the Christian faith and life. You'd be very welcome to come and join us. And you can find details of Life Explored on our church website at allsouls.org explore. The darkness then. The darkness, the desolation, the curtain, and the confession. Four great events in that one afternoon. W. H. Auden suspected that had he been there, he would have turned his head and moved on. Friends, tonight, don't miss the significance of what happened that afternoon. Let's turn our final song into our closing prayer this evening. And as the band leads us in Man of Sorrows, why not make it your response tonight? As Christians, we understand that death has been swallowed up in victory. Will you sing together with us as we celebrate the one whose love conquered death? i uh-huh. 
Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's been great to have you with us. As we draw to a close, let me lead us in a final prayer. Let's pray. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Heavenly Father, may we live as those who are grateful for the sacrifice your Son made on the cross for us. May we live as those who know the debt is paid, the curse of sin has no hold on us, and that we are free indeed. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with each one of us this day and forevermore. Amen.